Hey everybody, thank you so much. I just want to admit right off the bat, I am so nervous because I'm gonna get really deep into a pretty emotional journey today. So thanks in advance for being here with me. So, thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling that. Okay, I feel good, I feel better, yeah. All right, so um, yeah, my name is Caledonia Curry, also go by the name of Swoon. And uh, I've been an artist who's been lucky enough to work in all kinds of situations all over the world, from building rafts with 30 of my best friends and navigating them in the Adriatic Sea, to this time last year, I was working with an amazing group of artists that are bringing the healing capacity of art to the center of the opioid crisis in Kensington, Philadelphia. So I'm somebody who really cut a very clear place for myself as an artist way, way before I had really come to terms with who I was or where I'd come from or what I'd seen in life. And that process of confronting my life and confronting myself is what intersects with the work that you guys are doing here today. And so that's how I came to be talking to you guys. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be sharing quite a bit about my own life and uh, sharing a lot of personal histories and, and, and some very dark ones as well. And, and in doing that, I mean to kind of create a container to then talk about the psychedelic assisted therapy that's really helped me get into contact with so much that's been so important. And also to really give a sense of how much this work has meant to me and how I came to be here working at this intersection of art and psychedelic assisted therapy. So, I grew up in Florida, and I was born to parents who were heavily addicted to heroin. And it was, you know, a kind of environment where, you know, my early childhood was really marked by neglect and by proximity to violence and by serious mental illness. And it was just a place of incredible instability. Um, and there was a lot of love there. There was warmth and joy. My family really wanted to be good parents, um, but they were just deeply dysfunctionally unable to do that. And I'll just paint a picture so you get a sense of how we were living. Um, I was really little, I was maybe three or four, and my dad was uh, away in a rehab that he'd been forced into because of a near fatal overdose. And my mom and her super dangerous boyfriend dropped us off at a babysitter's house, didn't come back. So it took a couple days for the babysitter to track down like whose family these kids were, and she located an aunt and uncle who came to collect us. And then, you know, we started a life, we started living with that aunt and uncle and building a little stable life with them. And then one day my mom showed up, started a violent fight with my aunt, broke a bunch of plates over her head, and kidnapped us. So this was really not a place for two small children, my sister and I, to be growing up. Um, but, you know, life is complex, and that wasn't all there is to the story, because when my dad uh, got out of that rehab, he actually managed to stay clean for the rest of his life. And my mom uh, remained an addict for the rest of her life, but she actually eventually did manage to kind of develop sort of her own harm reduction model, and she lived on prescription drugs, and she really developed a way to be a good mom, and she, you know, made a life where she'd bake zucchini bread and take me to art classes. And so from about the age of 10 on, I did have like quite a lot of st support and stability. And so when it came time for me to launch into the next phase of my life, I was able to come to New York and start my life as an artist and to kind of try to imagine that none of those early years had ever really happened. Um, you know, and by the age of 27, I was showing all over the world and I had my first big one woman show here in New York and my work was in the Museum of Modern Art. So I was like, maybe I'm free? But I think, you know, I think of my early childhood as a little bit like a rubber band that encircled me and my life. And as soon as I had my goals in mind, I just took off running in the opposite direction of where I came from. And I was running and I was running. And at first, it was kind of easy. It was kind of springy and I couldn't really feel that this rubber band was there. But the further I got from my point of origin, the more that elastic kind of started to tighten. And, you know, it started to feel like I was running in slow motion. And I was a workaholic, and I never slept, and I was finding that I was driven by compulsive behaviors, and I lived in a hoarder's chaos. And I just kept running, and I ran harder. And the harder I ran, the more this elastic tightened until it started to snap me back into places I thought I would never end up again, places that were full of rage and violence and chaos. I became the aggressive one in abusive relationships. I, my body was in constant, almost crippling chronic pain. And while in some ways I felt like I was on top of the world, in other ways I felt like I was dying. And 
Here's the thing. I think so often we hear stories of artists, musicians, performers who've suffered some form of trauma and who are able to briefly translate that suffering into amazing works of art. But then we watch them burn out before our eyes and we don't know how to help them and we don't even really understand the degree to which their, their self-destruction is driven by trauma. And so instead, you know, we're left to kind of romanticize their suicides or to imagine that their self-destruction is some form of rebellion or just to kind of watch the beautiful sparks of their flaming out with an almost puerile fascination. But, you know, I don't believe that that's a viable form of rebellion any more than I believe that it's the inevitable cost of a creative life. And, you know, when I think about those stories that we all grew up with, what I see is another soul lost under the boot of unhealed pain and another opportunity for healing that's essentially been lost to our culture's kind of long history of ignoring and even suppressing the study of trauma. Because, you know, all the way back from Freud and his very early work in the asylums of Paris to doctors coming out of World War I and World War II, doctors tried to tell us about the study of trauma, but because our history and so often our reality is written by the victors, the dominant voices of our culture succeeded all the way up until the 1970s in denying the very existence of a traumatic syndrome and just claiming that soldiers who had endured trauma in war or women and children who endured trauma in the home were just weak-minded, hysterical, crazy, saying it was their fault, there's something wrong with them. And so with no way to name it, we had no way to heal it. And from my perspective within the arts, this meant that so many of the creative people that came before us really grew up in an atmosphere where that kind of flaming out and dying just seemed natural. It seemed sort of like part of our fates. But I think that as all of us in this room are pretty aware, there's a seismic shift happening right now. And you know, in some ways that started during the, the anti-Vietnam War, this sort of pushback, political pushback against the war, which led directly and indirectly to the, us actually gaining a formal PTSD diagnosis and all the way up into all the work that people are doing here with holistic and somatic and psychedelic therapies. You know, and so in this revolution of how we engage with traumatic suffering, I feel like there's this window opening, right? That's what we're doing here. And, you know, one of the ways that I see opportunity in that window is that I feel that we have an opportunity right now to change that tragic old narrative that we grew up with. And so the question that I'm asking myself is, you know, how do we as artists put not just our pain, but also our healing into the work that we do? The thing that I'd like to do is to take us on kind of an in-depth journey through a single work of art. So, and this is a piece that really embodies my own journey of healing through the creation of an artwork. And in telling the story of this artwork, I'll also be telling the story of how psychedelic assisted therapy really let me unfold into the depths of my psyche that most needed healing. So the installation is called Medea, and Medea is a Greek mythological sorceress who's best known for killing her two children. It's an installation that contains a series of biographical portraits, as well as a switchboard with a few dozen audio tracks that you can sit down and listen to. And in a sense, this installation started when I was about 15 years old. So maybe it's like a normal school day, I'm probably sitting on my bed drawing or talking on the phone, and all of a sudden, into my head, pops, almost like a daydream, but stronger, this vision of myself with insides like a switchboard. And if you imagine in this visual metaphor, your emotions are one end of the wire, and you'd usually find them patched into their appropriate causes. But inside me was this whole mess of wires. And in kind of a moment of clarity, I understood that I had scrambled up these wires. I had separated cause from effect and emotion from source. And I also knew that I had done all this mixing up in order to avoid an otherwise unbearable truth. And that truth was that I feared and hated somebody who I also adored and loved, who was my mother. And, you know, this kind of knowledge, it was like this tiny little pearl that I could hold on to and I could look at, but it had just come out of nowhere. It was this kind of very whole piece of wisdom and I was so young, I didn't have any in context to interpret it and so I kind of just put it aside till later. And 
You know, for years, my life and my family really continued to not make much sense to me. And, you know, when I looked out over my extended family, we really represented this incredibly broad spectrum of mental health issues. Um, you know, folks in my family suffered from schizophrenia, from disassociative identity disorder, suicidal depression, addiction, paranoid psychosis. And I just grew up my whole life with this fear that I was just going to get mine, that one day, like everyone around me, I would, I would fall apart. It seemed kind of inevitable. And I remember even kind of cornering my mom one day and demanding to know what had happened to cause so much distress in our family. And she just shrugged and said, nothing happened. There was no boogeyman. And then she was like, well, the one thing I can tell you is that my mother didn't love us, and we called her the Ice Queen. The Ice Queen, who was really my first level of understanding of the distress in my family, also became the outer layer of this installation. And, you know, after my grandmother passed away, I remember I was sitting in the snow, like looking at ice crystals, and I was just examining their beautiful complexity and seeing the way they melted when my breath hit them. And something about these forms, these like delicate, beautiful forms, kind of gave me the opportunity to think about the possibility that before my grandmother's defenses had eclipsed her tenderness, there may have been a time when she was sort of still delicate in this kind of place in her life. And so I drew her kind of in that understanding with this, like, the beauty and the delicacy of the, of the snowflakes uh, surrounding her. And here, she sits on top of a house. And the house is such a ready metaphor for the psyche. And here, the house splits open to reveal deeper layers of understanding. And the next element included in this installation I drew in 2011, and it's called The Devouring. And it's, in a way, it's a portrait that's about suffering, but it's also kind of an amulet or a talisman that's meant to keep suffering at bay because it was uh, started during an intervention. So my mom was sliding back down into a really messy phase of her addiction. Um, and the night that I arrived down to my family's house, she woke me up in the middle of the night and she was just wild-eyed, like a cornered animal, and she was freaking out, and she just woke me up, and she's kind of yelling at me and threatening me and being super abusive, and she's trying to tell me that nothing I've ever done matters and that I'm completely arrogant to ever think that I can help anyone. And I realized that she was trying to stop me from helping her by convincing me that I was worthless and ineffectual. And, you know, she was shaking and she was furious and the whites shone on the tops of her eyes and it was kind of shocking to me because even though my mom had been a lifelong addict and even though she struggled with instability uh, her baseline really was that of a very compassionate and supportive person you know she was bubbly and fun and mischievous she was the kind of person that strangers would tell their whole life story to in line at the grocery store because she really radiated this kind of kindness until she didn't, and then she didn't. And so that night, she was so terrifying that this image of her stayed with me for weeks until I finally took that mental picture that you see here of my familiar mother with a kind of a wild-eyed, demonic sense like coming out of her, and I pressed it into the paper for safekeeping. And shortly after this, uh, I was introduced to the work of a doctor named Gabor Mate, and uh, you know, through his work, I learned something that for some reason I had never known, which is that there is an undeniable link between debilitating addiction and childhood trauma. And this just like put a light on in my head and I became really hungry to understand the effects of trauma on the psyche. And so I started to research the literature and what I found essentially read like a roadmap to my entire family. And the most important thing he said was that addictions always originate in pain. And so the question is never really why the addiction, but why the pain? Why the pain? I mean, it was such a simple question. Yes, right? I mean, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. And it just shifted my focus. And this light just came on inside me. And, and something really started to change at that point. Um, and so the portrait that you see in the corner there is, uh, is a portrait of my mom in the cycles of her life and death because shortly after this, she was diagnosed with lung cancer and given just a few months to live. And in those few months, though, a transformation really happened between the two of us. 
And you know, because I had begun to understand the link between trauma and addiction, I became able to let go of these kind of childhood ideas that my mother was just this irresponsible hedonist who chose to love drugs more than she loved her children. And instead, this space opened up where I was able to kind of consider that maybe there had been a suffering so profound that it had disorganized who she was at a root level, and that she had spent so much of her life trying to soothe the pain of that. You know, and the kind of questions that I asked her went from questions like, why are you such a terrible person? To questions like, hey, what happened that caused you so much suffering that you've been trying to soothe it all this time? And, you know, with that new perspective, I became able to empathize with her. She became able to speak to me. I became able to forgive her before she died, which is something that I will always value. And we were able to reconnect, maybe in a deeper way than we ever had. And right before she died, she let me know that there actually had been a boogeyman, that there was a serious sexual predator in the family who'd preyed upon many of the kids in her family. And in that moment, I understood that between a sexual predator that no one was protecting her from and a hard, emotionally abusive mother, a dad that was absent at work all the time, no understanding of what was happening and no therapy to help her heal her psyche or nervous system. It was almost as though she had no chance but to fall into the role she did, which was the role of somebody that our dominant culture says is just a crazy junkie. And I really thought of her that way too for a lot of my life. But I recently was able to have a conversation with Gabor Mate about my mom. And I was talking about how despite her addiction and despite her kind of wild, terrible behaviors sometimes, that she was actually this incredibly sensitive person. And he said, you know what? He said, many times when a deeply sensitive person encounters trauma, those become the individuals that are the most susceptible to soothing that pain through addiction. And he said, you know, her addiction is not in spite of her sensitivity. In some ways, it's because of it. And after her death, I was able to kind of take that compassionate eye that I'd found for her and turn it back onto myself. And, you know, to really realize that maybe she wasn't the only one who had experienced trauma and to ask, like, how I might start to heal some of the scars from growing up within our family. And so I started talk therapy, which was amazing and helpful, and I love it. But I had this kind of urgency to heal and this feeling that I wanted to go deeper. And because so much of the major instability in my life happened before the age of five, I can't remember a lot of it. Or my memories of it are very unclear. And so it's really hard to talk that kind of stuff out and talk therapy. And yet I could still feel its tensions driving my life. And so I really wanted to find a way to connect with and to work through that material. And I had started to hear that ayahuasca is actually uh, a way that people can get in touch with this preverbal stuff. And so I sought out a circle. Um, and then within about the first five minutes of my first session, this kind of shadowy figure appeared that called herself Tarantula Mother. And I was not into it. And I immediately just blocked it out and I spent the rest of the session just fighting myself and everyone else just trying to avoid it. And if it was up to me, I think I probably would have avoided that image forever, but my therapist was like, hey, uh, don't you think you need to draw this? And eventually I would, but first I still had a little bit of avoiding and a little more healing to do. So the ayahuasca had showed me that I had some really deep material to work through. You know, but because I'd been such a nightmare in the circle, it had taken five people to hold me down, to stop me from clawing myself, clawing others, bashing my head up against the ground. It was really intense, and I didn't want to continue to put myself or others through this, and so I started exploring more options until I found uh, an underground therapist who works within a long tradition and who works with people with MDMA and sometimes with psilocybin. And so my first session was like this. We had done the preparatory work. We set our intentions for the work. And I'm laying down on the mat. And I'm just kind of trying to go inside and stay with the scary new feelings that are coming up. But I've managed to kick my socks off. And I'm kind of cold. And I can't like quite muster the coordination to get my socks back on. So I'm trying to ask the therapist if he can help me. But when I hear my voice, it comes out. I sound like a little baby. And I, and I say, can you help me put my socks back on me? And it was such a strange thing. And then and I watch him, and he's sort of doing this act of care. He's putting my socks back on me. And it was like, 
At that point, the transformation was complete, and I was in a fully regressed state, and I was just like a little tiny girl. And I talked like that for the rest of the session, and I had no control over what I said or did at all. It was almost like there were two me's at that point. There was this kind of writhing, talking child who pulled her hair and clawed her face and talked like a baby. And then there was this kind of grown-up, adult, witnessing self. And I can only watch, and I can't really control what's happening. And, you know, and there was also this feeling that maybe I was able to kind of witness um, some of my own memories, not by like re-experiencing them or picturing them, but by kind of listening to this child self that was talking. Um, and I even, you know, the following night, I woke up with this urge to look up babies who were withdrawing from heroin, and I found these videos of these little babies clawing their faces, and I was really shaken with this feeling that, you know, maybe I had been brought back not just into the regression of this little kid, but maybe all the way back into some of the earliest trauma of withdrawals that I went through. And so on the next session, I had done a little bit of reading and they said that if you're going through regression, it can help to bring props that remind you of that time. And so I brought a Raggedy Ann doll and you know, immediately the little, the little girl voice comes back and I'm talking and I'm telling stories and then I pick up the Raggedy Ann doll and I just start strangling it. And I'm saying, my mommy was gonna kill the baby and she was gonna strangle the baby because she didn't want to have a baby and kill the baby. And then I just ripped my shirt off my body. I'm grabbing at my neck and I just tear my shirt off my body and I rip it into shreds. And then I take one of those shreds and I wrap it around my arm hard like a heroin tourniquet. And I'm saying, they like to do it like this. They do it like this. And at this point, my therapist slows me down and stops me. And she says, okay, but you don't have to do this right now because it's important to kind of enlist the adult psyche in those moments and to slow people down and to kind of be able to uh, bring ourselves back into the present moment. And so, of course, I came out of this session with so many questions. You know, first of all, who is this little girl who's doing all this talking? Is she me? Do I believe her? You know, did I think that my mother was really gonna kill me? I mean, this was definitely not the kind of thought that I had on an average day. I didn't wanna believe it and I didn't wanna accept it. Um, you know, and after all, I'm here, right? She didn't kill me, so I was like, maybe this is just the crazed rambling of a mind under the influence. I'm not really sure how I can even know that. And so to return to the artwork for a bit, I decided to see what would happen if I brought the tarantula mother out into the form of a drawing. And so I started at the ground, and when I was looking up researching uh, source material for the drawing, I found that I had saved like dozens of images of Medea killing her children years ago for no reason. And, <laughs> yeah, <it's> so weird. <laughs> and then on top of the tarantula mother grew a house and it's filled with ancestors and memories. And then on top of the house grew a woman. And when I step back and look at this, I felt super shocked because this story had formed that I had never even intended to tell. And it, you know, the, the legs of the tarantula mother seemed to become the legs of this woman, and the mouth of the tarantula mother really became like this psychosexual kind of surrealist vulva. And she looks like she's in a bed, and she's kind of, uh, her eyes are cast upward away from the scene, and I really had this feeling that I had subconsciously drawn the wound of sexual abuse and the intergenerational effects of trauma all in one image, and I felt so dumbstruck that art could function in this way because, you know, I had not set out to draw this, but it sort of felt like that this process was kind of instructing my mind on the nature of itself. And so the final element of the installation was a switchboard. And the switchboard had been a metaphor for disassociation. You know, the impetus to scramble up these wires had been to hide something in the chaos. And so what lay before me now was to get really, really honest with myself about this question, which is what had been so terrible that I would lose part of myself in order to hide it. And, you know, because the switchboard had audio, um, I knew that I wanted to plug things into the channels, but I didn't know what it was yet, so I started collecting kind of randomly from psychology textbooks and fairy tales and, you know, recording them in fragments, and 
As I searched out material, I found that not only had I saved dozens of paintings of Medea killing her children, but I'd also written down dreams and nightmares about my mother strangling me or suffocating me. And the next thing I did was study cases of women who killed their children um, and sort of look at the case studies. And when I did, I just felt like chilled to the bone about the risk factors because every single one of them had been there in my mother's biography, from suicidality to psychosis. Many of these women felt helpless to their addictions and had been through domestic violence, had kids too young, and you know, it, again, this kind of felt like a roadmap of my mother's life. And most familiar of all was that these women loved their children. They felt that they were doing the right thing. You know, if suicidal, they thought that it was maybe better to take their kids with them. Or if psychotic, sometimes they felt that they were saving their kids from a fate worse than death at the hands of their mom. And I even found a Halloween costume in my 20s where I had dressed up like a baby eater. And it was just like I was trying to tell myself this story over and over and over again, but the same self that was telling the story couldn't hear it because I wasn't connected yet to really be able to listen to myself at that level. And so the final piece to complete the installation was that I wrote down and retold a psychotic episode that she'd had when I was little, where she believed that aliens were coming from the sky and that they were gonna eat everyone on Earth, including my sister and I, and that we couldn't escape them, but our only recourse was to a form of revenge, whereby if we drank alcohol to poison our tiny little bodies, that when they ate us, it would poison them too. This is where I really got into the wrestling match between what I knew and what I could accept knowing. Because that memory had disappeared from my mind for many years. And when it came back in my late teens, it came back suddenly. And with the presence of something that had always been there, it was like it had been in front of my vision the whole time, but I just hadn't been able to focus on it. And another thing that I knew, but I didn't really want to accept, is that that therapy session wasn't even the first time I'd told someone that my mom was gonna kill me. Because almost 15 years ago on a camping trip, I accidentally ingested a large dose of psychedelics and the next thing I knew, I was deep in the woods and I was telling a friend about the aliens and all of a sudden, I heard my voice say, and then my mom was gonna kill us. And it felt like time stood still in that moment and I just kind of floated up out of my body watching myself say this thing you know, this thought that felt so surprising and so new and yet so familiar at the same time. And so after that, I asked my dad and my sister, I said, did you guys ever think mom was gonna kill us that day? And I thought that they would just be outraged and defend her, but instead they just said, well, wasn't getting any better that day, was it? And then we all just thanked God that my dad had been there to rescue us. And so, you know, what I found was that piece by piece, my therapy and the creation of the Medea installation was actually creating a kind of a tangible container for my reticent knowledge that not just once, but many times through the course of my childhood, I had lived with this fear that my mom would kill me and that the fear had been so terrifying and so unacceptable that I just hadn't allowed myself to know about it. You know, because the wires hadn't been scrambled just to avoid being angry at her, they had been scrambled to bury this kind of uncanny understanding that I had that during these moments when she was in her depression or in her psychosis, that she might have been moments away from killing herself and taking her kids with me, with her. But when I stepped back again and looked at this installation, uh, what I realized was that in a way, making this piece was sort of performing this like alchemical magic on me. Um, you know, because I had started with this physicalized metaphor of disassociation, and because I had taken it really quite seriously and used it and plugged in fragmented pieces of memories and disassociated knowledge into the object itself, all this fragmented material had kind of come back together to form a coherent understanding. I had sort of worked backwards from fragmentation to disassociation, to reassociation. And I had been able to dive deep and kind of pull up the ends of the wires through my work with psychedelic assisted therapy. And I had worked through it a little bit further with EMDR and with talk therapy, but it still felt a bit scrambled and it still felt a little alienating and confusing. And, you know, I hadn't really integrated all that I'd learned and I was still fighting off some of it. But 
through the creation of the Medea, it was as though I just was able to meticulously comb through the wires inside me, and I was able to reconnect emotion from reaction and cause from event, and to locate my own coherent truth, and maybe most importantly, to find a way to believe myself when I express my fears. And this, believing myself and allowing myself to know what I know, has been one of the greatest gifts that's come out of this work. And so, you know, the result of all of this work combined is that I now feel much further away from burning out before my own eyes. And I also feel further away from the idea that unconscious and buried pain is the only path to great art. And, you know, instead, I have this kind of newly formed belief that healing is possible and that you can embody it through an, uh, the creative act. And so, you know, right now, all over the world, healers of all stripes are shifting culture when they say that women like my mom weren't just crazy, but that they were deeply wounded people that needed healing that they didn't get. And right now, I have an opportunity, thanks to the work of these brave healers, that my mom didn't have, her whole generation didn't have, my grandmother's generation didn't have. And the burden of gratitude that I feel for receiving that opportunity is one that it almost feels like it can only be passed on through sharing what I know. And so I feel like I want to participate, I want to try to participate in this kind of shifting of our culture uh, and to be one of those voices by saying that there is truly no imperative that we implode and die within the creative act. And that what I've found is that the muses love us just as much and maybe more when we allow ourselves to unfurl toward wholeness. And that when we become able to listen closely, I think that what we find is that this wholeness is exactly the place that they've been calling us to all along. Thank you. about any visions you could share for the future of where the crossroads of visual art mm -hmm. and the healing psychedelic community can merge? Mm -hmm. mm. That's such a great question. Um, I think that um, at the moment, my brain feels so kind of fritz that the idea of, I was like, oh, I don't know. But you know, I, I have to say, for example, this is not really a vision for the future. This is more like just a, a yearning in my heart. So are, is, are any of you guys familiar with Kensington Avenue in Philadelphia? Right? It's a hard place. <laughs> I don't get some cheers, but it's a tough place. So uh, I, I spent a bunch of time down there last year, and Kensington is this place where the, the concentration of human suffering is almost unparalleled. I've, I've really almost not seen, you know, maybe in San Francisco, um, places where people are living in trauma and living in addiction and living on the street in this way where you're just like, my God, like, is there nothing we can do? And we had some experiences down there. Mural Arts has this, um, uh, an art center, like right in the middle of this and people just come in and they say was well, this a rehab or what are you guys doing and they're like no we're just literally just making a place for people to make art and it sounds almost irrational at first until you realize how incredibly important it is that just a place to sit down and wash your hands and like get in touch with like some of the internal stuff is like a necessary step to reconnection with yourself and with others and and that stuff has to precede you know seeking rehab or any of the other stuff and so um, you know, when I was there, we did like song circles. We did all this kind of stuff that I was like, my God, like why, why can't like we nationally fund programs where like every day we have these like art centers and song circles and this really deep like soulful creative work in a place that feels like a war zone but that truly needs this kind of stuff. So uh, I don't <laughs> quite answer you? your question, but <laughs> that's what I'm putting out for. <laughs> I was just wondering whether you were considering putting your uh, therapeutic experiences in a book, like in a memoir, because I yeah. read, read the hell out of that. Oh, hell yeah. Thank you so much. I would love to. 
Yeah, I would really, I would really love to, and I really do think about it. And I, I might like just put it on the calendar. I'm looking at you right now. I'm gonna put it on the calendar for next summer to start that because, um, because yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's something that, and I'm sure the writing will teach me a lot. And yeah. And you could put pictures of your art. Right. In the book and totally. Totally. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Um, is your process influenced at all by um, the painter Max Ernst or the other surrealists that used um, the subconscious to work through mm. periods of trauma and like realize images and narratives in their own work? Mm. Um, you know, I haven't lately uh, been really in contact with the, with the sort of surrealist body of work, but I actually think that that's because it was so important to me as a teenager um, that it's just maybe foundational in a way that I don't even really think about it anymore. But, you know, certainly when I was a teenager, when I was that 15-year-old having that vision, you know, I was in Daytona Beach, Florida. It's like a tourist town. You know, there was so little dialogue around the subconscious and around the mystery and around reconnecting with ourselves. And so those were some of the first people that were like, hey, like there's a world in here and so yeah they were absolutely important to me I also work with women and retreat and when I see people working with psychedelic art therapy um, there's an unfolding and so when you're talking about whenever you created this image mm -hmm. and not even expecting what was going to come out that also so much mirrors a psychedelic experience right and so for you um, is it interesting to watch the unfolding in your work and how different is that whenever you're working, you know, with your therapist. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the thing that I kind of like had to truncate my talk at the middle, but I was, there was a thing that I was um, kind of getting in touch with about how, you know, when I had first had these moments, you know, where I was dressing up like the baby eater for Halloween or saving all the Medea images, it was as though there was this part of myself that kept trying to, t to speak and I just, it was like I was slapping down my own intuition because I was like, I don't want to know what you know. And so doing this felt like I had reconnected a circuit, right? Where I was like, oh, okay, this is actually starting to flow now. And you know, this may be a coincidence, but I also have kind of much more connection to uh, my sort of dreams that are premonitions and that sort of side of myself, the more instinctual nature, because I've sort of stopped blocking that circuit. And so, um, yeah, I think that the the process of letting things unfold and the it does mirror the surprise in the therapy sessions because the therapy sessions are a shock to me. I'm always like, what just happened? It's like watching a movie from inside my own head. You know, it's always a surprise. And so there is a way that the surprise of this unfolding really mirrors that as well. Thank Thanks. You.